afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here uh, on time. And thank you, Fina, for the uh, invitation to uh, present here today. Um, as you can see in the slide, uh, I'm going to be speaking about picking team sport with, uh, with a focus on, on water polo. Uh, so there is quite a bit of ground to cover, so I'll go fairly quickly. We're going to be talking about picking in individual sports as compared to team sports. And then we will immediately get into unique aspects of picking for team sports. And I'll uh, have consideration for two different situations. One would be tapering and picking for a league format competition. And the other one will be tapering and picking for a major tournament, such as the Olympic Games or World Championships. Then uh, I will show you some uh, statements from elite uh, water polo figures about tapering and picking. And then I will uh, speak about uh, assessing players' match fitness uh, by means of a test that we developed a few years ago at the Australian Institute of Sport, the WIST, the Water Polo Intermittent Shuttle Test. So uh, when we speak about tapering and picking uh, and we think about individual sports, we know that individual sport athletes normally achieve a fitness peak uh, through months of hard training followed by a segment of tapered training that culminates in the targeted race or competition, usually a major championship, world championships, or, or the Olympic Games. But this approach might not be the most suitable for team sport athletes who usually need to perform at a high level week after week to be in contention for the championship when it really counts. So uh, there is no point in tapering and picking for the final if you have not qualified for the final first. And it's true that most of the experimental and observational research on tapering and picking in the scientific literature has been conducted primarily in individual sports. Uh, so no study has directly examined the tapering in the context of multiple picking. So we do not know how often an athlete or a team can obtain the performance benefits of an efficient taper. But nevertheless, there are some recommendations that we can make regarding tapering and picking for team sports. And as I said, the first, uh, the first limitation is that the keys to team uh, sport performance are very uh, wide. So we, when we want to optimize performance in team sports, uh, we need to find a perfect balance between physical, physiological, technical, tactical, and psychological um, aspects of the game. And players' qualities are also very, very wide. Um, a cyclist might need a huge VO2 max, uh, a, a threshold through the roof, and good cycling efficiency, and basically you have a cyclist. In team sports, you normally don't, don't need such extreme values of any of those qualities, but you need a, a much more wide uh, variety of qualities that include sp speed, acceleration, and deceleration, uh, power, endurance, and agility. And then there is this abstract concept of uh, team dynamics. Why a team with the same player, same coach, same methods suddenly starts losing and losing and losing or the other way around, suddenly starts winning and, and everything goes the right way. So for a taper to be effective, it should affect most of these uh, factors. And that is very difficult to do. That's why uh, it's so difficult to carry out research in team sports. And there are a few other limitations. For example, the physiological determinants of team sport performance are not very clearly understood. Uh, so identifying physiological qualities in team sports is not the only requirement to be competitive. Secondly, performance is a very difficult concept to, um, to define in team sports. From the point of view of the head coach, performance is winning. From the point of view of the conditioning coach, we might say that a higher playing tempo for the duration of the match is a good performance, even if we lost. Or from the psychologist point of view, we might say that if the players were able to show their qualities and their abilities under the pressure of competition, they perform. Maybe they lost the game, but there was good performance. So it's difficult to measure performance in team sports. Another factor that limits the ability to do uh, research in team sports is that the number of activities in training is very, very wide. 
And it's very difficult to combine all those different activities in single units that we can actually quantify. Finally, in team sports, we have very long competitive seasons and with a lot of games, and it's very difficult to, um, to uh, impose additional loads on the players just because we are interested in doing some kind of research. And finally, there is a relatively high risk of injury in team sports, and that makes it difficult to carry out longitud longitudinal investigations during a competitive se um, season. However, what can we say about tapering and picking for a league format competition? This is the periodization model for uh, sports with a long competitive period. Normally, we compete for eight, nine months. Imagine uh, European football, for example. And what we need to achieve is a general fitness level that lasts the entire year, not the entire season, the entire year. Because if we allow that general fitness to drop too much during the transition period, the preparatory phase is not long enough to bring the players back up to a high fitness platform. So what we are trying to achieve during the preparatory phase is a high fitness platform that we more or less can maintain for the duration of the season. We usually achieve that by increasing the training loads and when we want to reach those optimum fitness peaks in blue, what we usually do is reduce the training load. So we taper the athletes to achieve those fitness peaks. So with this type of approach, what we could uh, consider for peaking is to apply a tapering strategy at the end of the preparatory phase to make sure that all or most of our athletes are either in the high fitness platform or in the optimal fitness peak from the first match of the season. That is not only a beautiful graph, that has been done and it has been published. This is, for example, a study that was done in Australia with uh, rugby league players in which they voluntarily overreached the athletes for six weeks, giving them uh, progressive overload training with very limited recovery, and they observed a reduction in muscular strength, power, and endurance, and they achieved that uh, overreaching state through increased muscle damage via a decrease in the anabolic catabolic balance of those players. And then they introduce a taper, a progressive taper at the end of the preseason to achieve a supercompensation of muscular strength, power, and endurance. And they achieve that by increasing anabolism and decreasing muscle damage. This is another study that was done in Australia with uh, female football and hockey players. And what you can see there is that these players were able to produce more work in a maximum intermittent sprint test after the taper. So in white, you have the situation before the taper. In black, you have after a 10-day taper. And those, um, those um, bars indicate five sprints of uh, six-second duration in a one-minute period. And as you can see from the second sprint to the fifth sprint, these players were able to produce uh, more work. So if you have a full team of players producing more work due to a taper, you can imply that the performance of the team is going to be improved. Whether we can translate this to a week-to-week -week situation is not clear. This is what we would be trying to achieve during a week in which we have one match, uh, one match per week, on Sunday, for example. The idea would be to increase the training load uh, towards the first half of the, of the week, and then to reduce the training load towards the second half so that we would have this type of uh, adaptive response that you can see in the red line. Things get a little bit more complicated or more simple when we have three games per week. Some people say things get complicated. I consider that things get easier because then we can basically forget about training. All we care about is recovering between games because we are going to get all the stimulus that we need from the game itself, at least in the case of the players who are going to be uh, spending more time during the match. And this is not only a beautiful graph either. Here you, we have an example of a, of a paper that has been published in which there is a description of the training contents of a high-level European football team 
when they have one match per week and when they have two matches per week. So we can, uh, we can do this type of analysis. This was done with the Juventus Football Club, but we can do this in water polo as well. So it's not just pure theory. Once you achieve that peak fitness at the beginning of the season, or at least that high fitness platform, how you maintain that uh, level of fitness throughout the season is a different story. And it's a story that depends on the time that you have between games. Is it 15 days? If, is it one week? Is it three days? Uh, whether we are traveling or not, what's the competitive level of the opponents? We might play a game in an overload situation if we are very confident that we are superior to the opponent and then plan a taper phase to play a game against a, a, a higher level team, for example. The level of injuries, the minutes of match play, um, the physiological adaptations to uh, training and competition of each individual players, the recovery strategies that we are using uh, with our players. So all those are factors that we need to keep in mind to maintain that peak fitness throughout the season. The second situation would be tapering and picking for a, for a major tournament. And what you see here, I know it's hard to, uh, to see, is a description of a tapering strategy in a professional, uh, not in, pro in professional football. This is the Danish national team preparing for the 2004 European Championships. And what you see there is the total time that they spent at different uh, values of heart rate during the 18-day period that they had to prepare for the championship. What they did was divide those 18 days in two phases. The phase in black is the overloading phase, and the phase in white is the tapering phase. And as you can see, they spent a lot more time at low intensities in the overloading phase, but they did not change much the time, the total training time that they spent at very high intensities. And that is one of the classic recommendations that we do about tapering based on the scientific literature available for individual sports, which is don't be afraid of reducing the training volume, but maintain a high training intensity. That's exactly the application of what we have learned from individual sports about tapering and picking, but applied to a team sport situation. The bottom graph is exactly the same thing, but instead of expressing a uh, heart rate in beats per minute, it's expressed in percentage of uh, maximum heart rate. However, we need to keep in mind that there is a huge variability in high intensity exercise, even during tactical training. We usually have a tendency to only measure training stress during physical conditioning or during fitness <coughs> specific sessions. And what you see there is two players participating in exactly the same tactical training sessions for those 18 days. And as you can see, although they are supposed to be doing the same exercise, the player in uh, white is spending a lot of time at low heart rate values and very little time at very high heart rate values. And the player in black is exactly the opposite. This doesn't mean that one of them is not working or is not doing what he should be doing. Maybe the focus of the coach is on attack and one player has to work much harder than the other. But that is something that we need to consider when we quantify the total training load and when we uh, plan our picking for each individual player. I'm going to give you an example of the application of tapering and picking principles for a team sport situation. Uh, I was working as a physiologist with the Australian uh, water polo teams in the lead up to Athens, and the coach requested my assistance to design the final macro cycle uh, for the Olympic Games. And we were conditioned by some um, commitments that the team already had, like participating in the French Cup, participating in the World League, and participating in the Italian Cup. And to make things a little bit easier, the coach told me we need to be really good at the Italian Cup, and even better at the Olympic Games. So the reason for that was that 
uh, or the reason he gave me for that is that at the Italian Cup is where you earn the respect of the referees. If you are not good at the Italian Cup immediately before the Olympics, the referees are not going to respect you because they are going to consider that you don't have a chance at the games, so you are not going to get anything from them. But what we did was design that, that particular microcycle that finished off with a taper immediately before uh, the Olympic Games and the Australian team ended up having good Olympic Games. The referees didn't give us anything in the, um, in the semi-final, uh, no, in the bronze medal game against the United States. They got something from the referees on the other hand. Uh, this is a book that I wrote a few years ago about tapering and picking, and in that book, in section three, I invited elite athletes and coaches to provide their ideas about tapering and picking. And there are a couple of contributions from um, uh, water polo coaches. One of them is Greg McFadden, and he explains what they did in terms of picking for world championships uh, in which they won silver in women's water polo. I think it was in Melbourne. He says, maintain a high intensity, increase the specificity, decrease the duration of the sessions, and adequately quantify the individual training load in the lead-up tournaments preceding the major event. Make sure that the players who are in the water longer during the lead-up tournaments receive enough recovery, whereas those receiving less match time receive extra training to maintain their fitness. So we had some players finishing the game and going straight to recovery, and some other players finishing the game and going straight in the water to do some real training because they had been sitting on the bench. Use post-training recovery techniques and optimal nutrition strategies and emphasize players' body size, strength, and power because this is considered to have a major impact on game quality. Finally, periodize the training plan to achieve uh, peak performance at the desired time. There is also a contribution from Dar Dragan Matutinovic, who was uh, the Croatian coach, but coaching the Spanish team uh, in the lead up to the Barcelona 92 Olympics. And he says, set specific difficult targets for the players to increase their physical and mental strength and determination, create a playing style early in the preparation process and compete against teams that play very different types of games and help the players to stay motivated, focused, relaxed, and free of external and internal pressure in the days before and during the event. So how can we assess whether our players are match fit? Uh, and that question is the, um, the question that made me uh, work to develop this uh, water polo intermittent shuttle test that was developed when I was working at the Australian Institute of Sport. Uh, the water polo intermittent shuttle test is similar to the yo-yo intermittent recovery test that is used in, in uh, terrestrial sports, in basically in football and basketball and rugby. So the distance that we selected was 7.5 meters, that's three Olympic uh, lanes, and the players have to be trading water uh, when they hear a beep, they have to go 7.5 meters, arrive to the second, to the turning point, in time with another beep, turn back and arrive in time with a third beep uh, to the starting point. Then they keep uh, recovering for 10 seconds and they go again. The initial speed, you get 14.5 seconds to go back and forth, recovery for 10. Then you have four shuttles at uh, between 1.03 and 1.36 meters per second then seven shuttles a little bit faster, and then there are incre increments in speed every eight shuttles. But the players always get 10 seconds recovery. The idea is to simulate the activity profile of, um, of water polo match play. So in order to create this test, uh, we had to, um, to do some research. And in the, in the first phase, what we did was a reliability study. And basically, we had a team doing First, a familiarization trial, 48 hours later, uh, the first trial, and 48 hours later, the second trial. And what you see here is the results of the reliability study. We looked at uh, performance, heart rate, and blood lactate, and we had uh, pretty decent um, 
values of reliability and coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation in performance was 5.4%, which is within the range of the tests that are available for performance analysis in, in, in sports. In the second phase, uh, we wanted to assess whether the test was able to detect um, differences in performance between standards of competition and between playing positions. So we tested uh, junior regional females, junior regional males, junior state level, um, level one, state level two, uh, senior elite females, senior national males, senior, uh, junior national males, and senior elite males. And as you can see, there is uh, growing performance levels uh, as the level of competition goes up. So basically the test is picking up these differences in, in the performance level of the, of the athletes. We also detected performance differences between field players, center forwards, and goalkeepers, which is what you would expect. In phase three, we wanted to see whether the test was valid. And to assess validity, you need to find a relationship between the test performance and the match performance. And the way we did this was by um, performing the WIST, and then 48 hours later, um, the, the players had four games in four days in the National League in, in Australia. And we asked the coaches to rank, uh, to, to produce a rank order list of match fitness based on those four games. So tell me who is your fittest player, he will get 12 points, and then down to your less fit player who will get one point. And we try to correlate those, uh, those points with the results obtained in the water polo intermittent shuttle test. You see the correlations there between uh, the performance in the test and the match score. Uh, A is all field players. The correlation is not great, but when we withdrew the uh, center forwards, the correlation got much better. In phase four, uh, we wanted to know whether the test was sensitive to track uh, changes in performance throughout the season. And in fact, it did. You see there the, the um, performance level in the test in the preseason, uh, then when they start the championship, throughout the championship, and in the picking phase towards the finals uh, in the month of November. So you see that the test is all, all also able to pick up changes in the fitness level of the players. So the conclusions from the validation studies of the WIST were that the WIST appears to be a reliable, sensitive, and valid measure of match fitness for water polo players. Test performance of center forwards should not be compared to that of other field players. And the WIST could become a useful tool for coaches and sports scientists to assess the effects of different interventions on match fitness. The next question is always, so where do we get it? because for a few years the test has not been available. Uh, and the uh, Australian Sports Commission just uh, made an MP3 version of the test. That is the website where you can find it. I have no involvement. I'm not making any money out of this. It's just because people ask me, how do we get the test? That's where you get it. You get it at the, um, at the Australian um, Sports Commission website and that's the, uh, that's the link where you can find it. So you download the MP3, you, down, you download a PDF with the instructions on how to run the test and, and some, um, some uh, reference values uh, that you can use to compare your players to those uh, values that we found. Thank you very much for your attention.